Well, folks, welcome to one more edition of Politics and Right. I'm Egberto Willis, your host. Thank you so kind for being a part of the show. We're going to have a great show for you today. As usual, where are my peeps? Please make yourself known. Get on and go ahead and give us that thumbs up on Facebook, or rather on, on YouTube. Give us that like on Facebook. And exactly do all of that for us right now before we get started with the program. I need to do one more Q&A and then we'll be ready to get busy. As you know, we get busy. I don't think I re remember to do my zap, which brings in our some of our email folks. So I'm going to Zapier so that Zapier can take care of bringing us into the... You remember that song by Bob Marley coming in from the cold? Well, we're going to have... Zapper attempt to bring us in from the cold as soon as I can read the screen out of these bright lights. I think I can do it. I think I can. I think I can. And here we go. Uh, go ahead and say run. And I've just run the network. Okay, okay, we're back. We're back. We're back. Anyhow, we're going to have a great, great program for you today, guys. We have Norman Solomon, of course. He has a take on Russia. He wrote a hell of an article that I, I liked, and I contacted him and said, hey, man, you got to talk about that article that you wrote on, 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 on the Russia issue because there's much that people don't know. Bruce Follard says, peep, peep. All right, let's start. Eric Hayes, welcome aboard. Bruce Pollard, welcome aboard. Ryan Featherstone, hi there, my dear brother. Melanie Keaton, hola todos. Good evening, everybody. She says AVQ, of course, is here with us with his narrative. And this time he only brought one. He says, Egberto, just one long snippet from Tom Hartman that I hope you read out in full. Um, you only have one. Of course, I'm going to read it out. Well, actually, I always read your stuff out in full best I can. I love Tom Hartman. He's been on our show several times. Will U.S. turn away from fascism? Yeah, he wrote that article this morning and he actually has the article. Well, uh, he has the article on, uh, on Common Dreams and other places. Will the U.S. turn away from fascism and abandon this GOP death cult? It is unsustainable. The public is both exhausted and increasingly sickened by Republicans who appear to be devoid of any principles whatsoever. I am. I love Tom, but I I continue to look at seventy something million people who voted for Trump, and think it's more than that. People are exhausted as opposed to. We have a lot of work to do, but I digress. Republican politicians on the ground have stopped even pretending to hold or promote the values that they were traditionally the mother's milk of campaigning. Republicans no longer even bother to hold town hall meetings with constituents. Many Republicans don't answer their publicly published phones any longer. Mitch McConnell long ago gave up on principle or ethics. He's been all about pure power since Obama was elected. The party that has long proclaimed itself the champion of family values can't even muster a dozen votes to extend the child tax credit or support free preschool. The party of morality that spent three years going after Bill Clinton for getting a BJ from a consenting adult no longer even bothers to justify Trump's 20 plus charges of rape and sexual assault. The Law and Order Party has declared that assaulting over 140 police so severely they had to be hospitalized, smearing feces on the walls of the U.S. Capitol, and trying to overthrow our government or legitimate political discourse. Imagine that. Legitimate political discourse. Remember that phrase. Remember that phrase. Republicans believe that the terrorist attack on our capital was legitimate political discourse. Republicans always claimed to be the best at economics, but have embraced tax cuts since 1981 that have created a $30 trillion national debt. The party of one nation under God has embraced open racism in its attack on teaching black history, patriotism, and honor who are values. The GOP has used for decades to woo voters but since trump the party doesn't even bother even uh, and again i love tom i digress with tom a bit there this didn't start with trump trump just made it more vocal and honorable for these terrorists to come out of the woodworks and others even science is no longer something republicans feel comfortable with 
from COVID to sex ed to evolution and climate change. And don't even think about honest history. Republicans across the nation are trying to ban the stories of the struggles of Black, Hispanic, Asian, and Native Americans. Republicans used to be performatively embrace, or rather, Republicans used to performatively embrace kindness. Kissing babies was always big, but now they openly promote assault weapons and militias that are simply this generation's brutal version of the Klan. Uh, Tom Hartman, I love what he had to say. And that entire article that he wrote was spot on. A couple of things I would have said a bit differently, but it's Tom. Tom is, uh, we, we, it is Tom, brother. It's Tom. All right. Uh, continuing, we have uh, Michael. Uh, Michael, hey, Eric Hayes says, why are blue states dropping mass mandates? Are they following science and rejecting Fauci, who said he is science? No people are fed up of government control and won't have it anymore. No, that's not the reason why. If the virus, uh, if, if we had no therapeutics, if, if we had none of these things that could mitigate the irresponsibility of those who didn't get vaccinated, there's a good likelihood the mass mandate would not be removed. But I mean, just like we don't have a mass mandate for, let's say, uh, some very transmissible um, diseases, uh, eventually, when uh, COVID becomes a bit more therapeutically controlled, it is okay to have for those who want to be free to pollute, let them be as long as those of us who are intending to be responsible continue to voluntarily be responsible. And to those who don't cherish life, let them go ahead and not cherish life as they please. Uh, Ryan Featherstone says he's here. Bruce says, peep, peep, I'm here. Uh, Michael responded, he said, and it's not the good news the right-wing bubble seems to think it is. It's a surrendering in the effort to flatten the curve. We have to learn how to live with COVID as we move from a pandemic to an endemic phase of the virus. And that's the scientific reason, El Senor um, uh, Rudnan. Uh, let's see. Michael Rudnan says, makes me, makes me wish Egberto could post this on the screen. I, I, haven't, I, I changed the driver on the screen. But I'm not convinced that it's fixed yet, so I don't want to take the chance and do it yet. But eventually, we will be back with those screenshots. Eric Hayes, you'll probably never see this, but people are taking even more precautions and now than ever during the start of the pandemic due to how contagious Omicron is. Egberto, from Rudden, Egberto Trump gave conservatives permission to act out their worst selves in public. Hate, racism, and xenophobia have always been or always been winding threads with conservatives, but the, those usually rightfully brought shame. Paul Fleming says, ATL checking in. Welcome, my brother Paul. I hope all is well with you. Love to you, my brother. Biden administration expect a loss in jobs for January this year, right? Adding jobs could be from people being tired of government mandates and just getting... You can't just give the guy and say the economy is running right. In fact, I'm going to play a piece on the economy after I do uh, Solomon. So let's go ahead and get started with El, Senor, um, with El Senor Norman Solomon, because I think you're going to like uh, what he has to say. What he has to say is, what he has to say is present, and it's time for us to get with the program. So here is El Senor Norman Solomon. Welcome to one more edition of Politics Done Right. Today, we are honored to have Norman Solomon. He's a co-founder and national coordinator of RootsAction.org. His book include War Made Easy, How Presidents and Pundits Keep Spinning Us to Death, printed in 2006, and Made Love, Got War, Make Love, but Got War, Close Encounters with America's Warfare State. Senor Solomon, welcome to Politics Done Right once again. How are you doing today? Oh, just very well, and I'm so glad to be with you again. Well, look, uh, you always have something to say and you always have something to nourish people's minds uh, with. So thank you so kind for being out here with us. Let's talk Ukraine. I want to get right into it because this is an issue that I don't quite understand as I should. What the hell is the problem? What are we doing over there right after leaving Afghanistan? Well, of course, it's complicated in Ukraine and I don't want to claim to be an expert on the country, but I do have, I think, 
a good grasp of what's happening politically in the United States vis-a-vis -vis the conflict with Russia and that whole NATO situation. I'm reminded of a book that the novelist Norman Mailer wrote, and the title was, Why Are We in Vietnam? And the word Vietnam did not appear until the last page of the book. And I think this was a way of saying that the internal dynamics and the domestic needs of certain powerful forces really guide foreign policy. And it was true in the 1960s, and I think it's true in 2022. There is, after all, a history where the United States, as we remember, for 20 years in Afghanistan, and you cannot sell enough weapons to the Pentagon if you're withdrawing from countries. And so this is not a conspiracy theory, it's just to say that tremendous amounts of profits are being made from these arms sales to the Pentagon. And let's face it, huge amounts of weapons are now being shipped by the United States into Ukraine and the surrounding region. I am so happy that you brought up the defense industrial complex and the need to feed the animal because I've been speaking about that for some time, but having you uh, corroborate that stuff, it, it, it is, it is, it makes a hell of a lot of sense. Now, there is something that I want to back up to, something that was in your article that I actually learned, and that was I didn't realize there's a tacit agreement between the United States and Russia that uh, NATO would not have expanded. And now that NATO has expanded and uh, Russia may be a bit concerned about Ukraine going into NATO, it seems to me like a lot of the American people don't understand that there is another level of indirection to this entire Ukraine issue. Why don't you tell us a little bit about, about that? Yes, something that we know from our own lives, if we've been fairly alert by the time we're you know, adults, walk a mile in my shoes is very helpful. If we don't think about how somebody else might see the world, we're going to get into all sorts of conflicts. It's not just me, 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 but in foreign policy, often when you're the biggest power on the planet, there's this tremendous temptation often fulfilled United States of America. It's all about us. Well, anybody who's been overseas in other countries and talked to people likely noticed that not everybody wants to just defer to Uncle Sam. So in this situation, if we imagine that a Russian-led military alliance invited Canada or Mexico as allies and started shipping weapons uh, through Mexico City to the border areas uh, of Mexico next to Texas, what do you think the response from Washington would be? I mean, the question answers itself. Absolutely intolerable. We had a Cuban Missile Crisis with uh, real dangerous stupidity on both sides in 1962 when there were missiles put in Cuba. So when we turn it around, walk a mile in my shoes, look out the window at the Kremlin and you see the United States after promising, and this is documented, now the National Security Archive has published these documents. Then Secretary of State James Baker said uh, in 1990, when the Berlin Wall was falling, promised then Soviet Union becoming Russia, not one inch eastward will NATO expand. That promise has been broken time and again, a dozen times moving up to the Russian border. And so now Ukraine, which is a hugely important country for Russia on the border, not really that important to the US, now it's just for Russian policymakers, the idea that Ukraine would become part of NATO is just intolerable. And yet, you know, we look at the news media in this country, that is barely mentioned. You know, it, it is sad because uh, many, many, uh, you are speaking about this today. And when this go out, there are some people that are going to make, make the, give the impression that what you are is pro-Russian or that what you are is anti-American because you're simply telling some geopolitical truths. Now, I think if more Americans understood that, look, we don't have, as a country, we don't have the best records in keeping, uh, the, 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 keeping to the treaties that we sign. Ask the natives, ask uh, the folks who thought they were going to get 40 acres and the mule, ask all these people whether or not we honor uh, agreements, whether written or verbalized. We generally don't. And this is another instance, and I, I mean, this is an instant that could cause 
severe, a severe problem to the American people. Why don't you kind of expand on that? Absolutely. I, I think you encapsulated and telescoped this just profound truth. The history of the United States, and I'm not just talking centuries ago, I'm talking recent years. The U.S. not only cast the first stone, but the second and the third, because we're the biggest on the block. We have the most powerful military on and on. During the Vietnam War, one of the two senators to vote against the awful Gulf of Tonkin resolution, Senator Wayne Moore said, might does not make right is just as wrong when we do it as when Russia does it. And when you set that climate where, okay, we can invade one country after another, it becomes very clear to other countries, you can't trust Uncle Sam. I was blown away. I heard Michael McFaul, the former Obama ambassador uh, to the uh, Kremlin, to Moscow, on the BBC the other day, and he's saying it elsewhere. We can't have an international order when one country can just go around invading another? Well, sure, I agree with that. But how can the United States, after invading Afghanistan, invading Iraq and continuing wars there for decades, we're going around and we're preaching to other people? We're, we're telling Russia on your own border, just shut up because it doesn't concern you that we're shipping weapons into this country that's right next to you? Um, you were actually being pretty kind. I mean, you didn't mention Panama. You didn't mention yes. Granada. You didn't mention all the, all the South American incursions. I mean, the truth of the matter is uh, we don't, one, one likes, one would respect leading by example, and we don't quite do that. And it's not anti-American or unpaid. In fact, I think it is anti-American not to let the American populace understand what's being done in their on their behalf or in their names because one many times we ask why don't they like us it's not that they don't like us they love us they don't just don't like what our government go go out there and does your you know, point Roberto, you're reminding me of a bumper sticker that i saw when the u.s invaded iraq and it had a picture of the american flag and it said these colors don't run the world and that's a real hard one for some mm -hmm. Americans to swallow, that we don't just get to tell other countries and work our will uh, diplomatically and, if necessary, militarily. The first anti-war demonstration I ever went to was April 15th, 1967, in New York City. And that was a week and a half after Martin Luther King Jr. gave his now famous speech at Riverside Church. And he said, quite candidly, in his words, that the United States was the biggest purveyor of violence on the planet. Yes. And here we are, well into the third decade of the 21st century, and you look at Afghanistan, you look at Iraq, you look at our history, that is unfortunately still the case. It is, it, it, it is sad. And again, I, I think the, the most patriotic thing people like you are doing is out there telling the truth, telling it like it is out of your article and folks the name of the article is in the salon magazine or salon our uh, salon website it's u.s hypocrisy on ukraine paralyzes media congress and even progressive democrats and in that article he lays out norman solomon lays out perfectly how we the people the fourth estate has given our government a pass uh democrats uh, which are the in government has given reality a pass Look, that was an excellent article that I think everybody needs to read. Everybody needs to understand. It is not an, a pro-Russian article. It's just a fact-based article that all need to read and would make us a hell of a lot more educated. Um, I always ask my uh, the folks that I question, what would you have liked me to ask you uh, that I didn't? And, and please make it as expansive as possible, because like I said, you're the one who knows quite a bit more about Ukraine and what's going on there than I do that my audience would definitely appreciate. Well, I think as walking on two legs, the understanding and analysis is, they're crucial. And also it's the action is crucial. And I'm so proud to work with a team at rootsaction.org because we started with no one on our email list. We now have 1.2 million in the United States and everybody watching and listening is invited. If you're not getting our action alerts, you can join with other people. It's domestic issues, healthcare, housing, the environment. It's overseas foreign policy issues like we're talking about. Please join us at rootsaction.org. I think an underlying question is, 
one of the key ones is how does this connect to the suffering that goes on in the United States and the way in which 55 plus percent of the discretionary budget of the federal government goes to the military. And this is just uh, really violence even, and he was no radical. Dwight Eisenhower said every bomber, every plane, every tank is in a real sense a theft from the children of the world. And that includes in our country, we have healthcare rates, we have suffering and deaths among children that are worse than in some of the most impoverished third world countries. We have to change this. It's really about priorities. Rootsaction.org, folks. Please sign up at rootsaction.org. Norman Solomon, co-founder and national coordinator of rootsaction.org. Thank you so kindly, first of all, for all the work that you do. Secondly, for keeping us up to date with articles like you've, like, like you've had at Salon, and just for being here to expose our audience with the truth, with information to nourish your minds. Thank you so kindly for having been on Politics Done Right, Norman Solomon. Well, thank you, and thanks for Politics Done Right, all you're doing, and to everybody listening and watching, please support this program. Thank you so kindly. We spend a lot of Okay, folks, I hope you, you enjoyed that. Uh, Norman Solomon's good guy works very, very, very hard. Okay, let's go ahead and continue this. Let's see. Uh, para ver, where was I on the top? Uh, para ver, Eric Hayes says natural. No, I think I, I need to go up a little further. Yeah, listen to Eric, I mean, to Paul Fleming Sr. He says, hit that like button if you're on, if you're on Facebook. Hit the like button if you're on YouTube. Hit that thumbs up button. Let's go ahead and get this stuff going. Michael Rodden said, Eric Hayes, the unemployment rate is now 4% during a pandemic winter. 4%, that's full employment. Again, it is not a bad, the bad news you think it is. And we're going to uh, play a piece on that shortly. Daniel Lido says, do y'all hear, a, uh, you, do y'all hear Ho Egberto and his disciples characterize the, pi the pitiful opposition? Evil, racist, uncaring murderers. That is why Egberto is wrong about civil war. You cannot demonize your fellow citizens like that and expect domestic tranquility. Let me show you or tell you something. Uh, when you hear us categorize those who deserve that categorization, which is usually the leaders of the party, which are just generally the operatives of the party, Anybody who listens to my show on a consistent basis know what my beliefs really are. And my beliefs are as follows. Most Americans just want to live. Most Americans are good people. Most Americans are not intrinsically, hear what I'm saying, and this is important, intrinsically racist, but are made to be that way based on the leaders they follow. So when it comes to taking, uh, taking care of business, my goal is to reach those who can then make sure to not ensure those racists get elected, those racist, homophobic uh, folks don't get a chance to perform and cause ill to the American people. So no, uh, there's no civil war here. I have no intentions of picking up a gun, picking up a knife, or picking up a spear to, to oust any of my uh, brothers and sisters, whether Republican, Democrat, or otherwise. And I truly, truly believe that. I can't be a progressive, look at another human being, and somehow see somebody I want to kill, or somebody I want to harm, or somebody that I would allow harm to occur to. But that's not the case for many people in the leadership of the Republican Party. That's why they lie to you about Medicare for all. That's why they lie to you about the Medicaid expansion to the Affordable Care Act. That is why I automatically and constantly call the people in Austin, every single uh, congressperson, and I think it's currently only Republicans, every single congressperson that votes against the Medicaid expansion to the Affordable Care Act, they are killers and murderers, okay? And, and I stand by that. I would tell each, if, if I got any one of them on my show, they wouldn't come, but I would try to get them. I would tell them that they're murdering people because they're knowingly causing the deaths of American citizens with, a, with, a, with, a, with policies that actually harm. And I don't take that back. 
I cannot. Oh, I, I have a, a meeting at five o'clock. So today I'm going to have to end the show about three minutes early with uh, because I got a meeting with Medium. So about three minutes early. But anyhow, people, so please. Or actually, I was going about four minutes early. Um, I want you guys to understand this uh, because I, I don't want Daniel Ledo to go unanswered. And I'm going to repeat what Daniel says. He says, do you all hear how Egberto... And his disciple characterized the pitiful opposition as evil, racist, and caring murderers. No, their leaders are, and their leaders have imparted that behavior on many of them. But I don't care about them. I care about extricating their behavior. I do when I say I love them. I want them to be on our team because they are, in fact, on our team. That's what I truly believe from the depths of my heart. All right, continuing. Nanette Bird smith welcome aboard, my dear lady. Eric Hayes says, natural gas and the NATO push to the east. Look at what China and Russia are saying. Biden has a huge challenge, and the Afghanistan was a sick man. You're all over the place. Unfortunately, it doesn't compute. Biden could have just used the Afghanistan assets for Ukraine, but um, don't think the Taliban will give them up now. Huh? Why would they use... Uh, uh, again, listening to the right wing makes, makes you less than, than practical. Michael Rennes says, Daniel Ledo, the entirety of the Republican Party does less than nothing for the American people. As for the racist, hateful, and xenophobic, that describes roughly half the Trump supporters. Uh, Paul Fleming says, just because unemployment rate is 4% doesn't mean that all is well. People of color unemployment rate is 7%, which is unacceptable, which I agree with. And I think I stated that in the blog that I wrote uh, consequently. Eric says, why do you think Rocket Man in North Korea is active now and Iran building up the nuclear capability all the way? Uh, so we saw Afghanistan debacle and now they're all pounced. Again, when you don't follow history and when you listen to those who would mislead you, that's what you get. We had a treaty with Iran. Every national organization points out that Iran was living up to the treaty we had. Donald Trump ripped up the treaty because he made some promise to a few neoliberals okay let's let's just be clear on how that occurred uh he got rid of the treaty there ain't no treaty and the person who got rid of the treaty was donald trump so anything rocket man is doing without a treaty or not rocket man uh, uh, anything that uh, iran is doing without a treaty go thank donald trump and as far as rocket man is concerned rocket man simply used donald trump as a poster boy it's that simple all right, Michael Ren says, why did we have a Cuban missile crisis? We put missiles in Turkey and Italy in 1961 that could reach Russia or unprovoked aggression made Russia return the favor. And then that was a deal that they made to take the, the missiles out of Cuba. I don't know if you remember, they didn't make it allowed. The deal that America, that Russia had to make was, hey, we are going to remove those missiles from Turkey, but you can't say that that's what we're doing. And a few months later, the missiles were removed from Turkey. All right. Paul Fleming says Republicans started out helping 30% of Americans as they lost the ability to draw people of color down to 1% and are now pressing change for the country. And, and you saw the thing I wrote about how we are becoming a minority rule country with the help of the courts. And if you see what the court did for Alabama yesterday, classic example of what's going to be done going forward. Uh, Eric Hayes uh, says, hey, Norman, Russia was in a war with Afghanistan before the U.S., right? So it's not just America bad man. Of course not. We've, we, I don't think anybody's defending Russia as being some, some uh, virtue, some, uh, some country of virtue. Uh, El Senor Putin is an evil SOP. We have people like Donald Trump who embraces him. We have people like Tucker Carlson who loves him. So let's be real here. Listen to Tucker Carlson talk about Putin and you'll understand. Uh, Renan says the Nazis were hung during the Nuremberg trials primarily for planning and waging war of aggression. If those laws were applied to our own, every president since the end of the Second World War, with the exception of J Jimmy Carter, which is the only president in recent times that have never gone to war, would have been hung. We cannot be hypocrites on the international stage. Our colonial imperial ambitions must end. Paul Fleming says, note that we are the majority republic. Note that we are the majority Republicans have changed. Voting maps and voting laws taking over the levers of control, the outcome of elections, no matter how we vote. We're at war and we're losing. We're losing, but we can still win. We have the time to win. So let's work at it, folks. 
you prop up other people to go ahead. Thanks for finding the article uh, up from uh, uh, Solomon. Uh, he has it in the feed, folks. Okay, let's continue here. Michael Rennes says, found, oh, you found the article. Paul Fleming says, ref, that's a reply. Plus one, subscribe to their newsletter. Thank you, thank you, thank you for subscribing to the Brothers' New Letter. All right, continuing. Carl Cox says, the conservatives have always been interested in helping the top 10%, especially the top 0.5% in terms of wealth. The conservatives want even more money in the form of legalized bribery. Yeah, I mean, the reason why you do a lot of that, right, is if you can concentrate the money in a, the hands of a few, you only need to beg a few for the money. Then again, you could be like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who actually loves people and know how to get it done by seeding, by having the masses invest in her. And by investing in her, they feel they have a vested interest in what she does. Wow. Cool. Wow, stellar, right? Paul Fleming says, I will keep repeating, the civil war is at the voting booth. Please beat this drum. Thank you, Paul Fleming. You are absolutely correct. And Annette Birdsmith says, as far as demonization, actions speak louder than words. Agreed. Ukraine has four operating nuclear power plants with 15 reactors. Some may not be hardened for war. They're, they were the number three nuclear nation in 1990. They made a deal Gave them back to Russia for guaranteed security. The U.S. was involved. Yes, they were. And I think Norman Solomon mentioned that in the article as well. Egberto from Eric Hayes. Egberto, we have been continuously lied to via COVID and with this administration, right? Look at the change in message. No, uh, again, that is where people don't understand science, right? Uh, we do studies. We come out with results. And there are certain results that are, that are, that are partial. And we make assumptions. And then we get create hypotheses. And then the hypotheses don't become a fact until you know it's general proven. And 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 what we do is we change as we learn. That's what it's all about. Kimmy Jin, welcome aboard. The answer today is the ballot box. Get out and flip the Senate and expand majority in the House. I am so with you, Kinnipin. Uh, e two two four seven says think on how companies might or might not profit from the technology. Hufenagel and Garfunkel. <laughs> that the consequence that that is funny, brother. That is funny. Let's take an example. Single pair would save sixty-eight thousand unnecessary debts compared to our current for-profit system. Republicans stand against single pair, which is why I say Republicans do less than nothing for Americans. Not only that, they claim to be the party of life, but don't support policies that enhances life. I don't know. All right, let's see what else we got. Uh, uh, from Nanette Birdsmith says, Eric Hayes, you are a broken record. <laughs> to which Eric Hayes responded, Egberto, Afghanistan debacle from Biden direction is a signal from Rutgers to be bad. No, I don't think so at all, but you can keep trying. Uh, Bruce says, I have relieved Fauci from dedication to science. Now he is a politician, so I don't hold him to the rules of science. I still hold Fauci to the rules of science, but he has to do it within the political context. That doesn't mean that he is not a rule of science, in my humble opinion. Uh, let's see. Byron Mason. This civil war people are talking about having will get cool uniforms, or will we just have to go with what we got? How will I know people on my side versus theirs? MAGA hats. <laughs> what street? will this warfare take place on i'm doubtful the scottsdale is gonna want to participate won't be good for tourism or housing values just need some details and while we are taking guns out here in the open carry hand if i am a bad guy with a gun and walk into an establishment meaning ill will who are the first people that i'm going to shoot you guessed it the good guy that has the gun openly on his hip before he ever knew it was coming He'll be dead as doornail because of freedoms just like this dead, unvaxxed brethren. Hey, I don't think I've heard from you before, Baron Marx, but I mean, that, that, you notice I kind of read it poetically because that, you wrote that as, a po as poetry, brother. Thank you, Byron. Daniel Ledo. Daniel Ledo says, I think my daily monitoring of this propaganda program has convinced me of one thing. There is no longer common ground between us. This insanity cannot go on. The best solution is divorce. Otherwise, leftist ideology will have us all in a horrific dystopia. What you mean is that we are so right with our ideology, basically, meaning we love people, we want people to live a good life, that because you understand that that is actually going to win out, 
you want to cut it loose by violence. To which I tell my brethren on the left, no to violence. If somebody slap you, slap them back. But you don't go out there and fight to, for the sake of fighting some war. Don't allow anybody to take advantage of you. But we are one nation under the sky. Let's not forget that. All right. Uh, Carl Cox says, AOC doesn't love herself. That's the megalomaniac like Trump. No, 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 no. Check out AOC is for real. I've spoken to her. I've spoken to AOC directly. And I had a, before that, inter, that, before that five minute interview, actually we did it twice. Before that five minute interview, I had a, like a 20 minute conversation with her because nobody believed she was going to beat that, the, the guy that she beat, which uh, was supposed to be the speaker of the house, but she beat him. And I told her she would. Uh, let's see, Kevin Gaines says, single care program and others are to deter people from buying drugs from Canada. I don't care if they buy drugs from Canada. I don't care if they buy drugs from anywhere as long as they're good, right? Anyhow, uh, we were talking about the economy earlier. The economy, as, uh, as you, you're going to hear from Chris and his guests, is pretty good. But as some of our people in the chat here says, which they are absolutely right, it doesn't cut the same across the board. So when uh, when my when my good friend Paul Fleming says, you know, it four percent is one thing, but let looks let's look at everybody. There is a problem. He's absolutely right. I want you to listen to this, and then we'll go ahead and take it on the other side. Check it out. Great piece out in the Atlantic today that really captures my feelings about this economy and how we've been trying to cover it here on this program. The headline, somewhat cheeky, the economy is good, actually, and it is by the fantastic economic journalist Zachary Carter, who also wrote the award-winning book, The Price of Peace, which is a biography of economist John Maynard Keynes, a book I really highly recommend. Of course, it's Keynes's theories uh, that help guide the world out of the Great Depression. Keynes's thinking has also guided the economic policy we have seen during the current recovery, huge amounts of fiscal stimulus and federal spending. In fact, as Carter notes, the federal government spent far more money over the course of the pandemic than it did in the response to the 2008 crash and spent more of the money on ordinary families. And the results of all this are tangible, like the child tax credit expansion cutting child poverty in half. For workers, the 467,000 jobs created in January are more than triple what was expected. That's allowing people to leave their jobs for better ones at record levels, raising low-wage worker pay even after factoring inflation into the mix. Even bankruptcies dropped by 24% in 2021. Look at that. That's us all the way over on the right. That's the lowest point for personal bankruptcy in decades. That's a 25-year chart, and it's never been lower on the chart. The only real question I have, and it's a persistent one, is why won't the left take credit for such an incredible accomplishment? Zach Carter, who wrote that, that piece, joins me now. Zach, first, first make the case. Uh, I mean, I make this case a lot. I think you and I are in a sort of small cohort. <laughs> We're sort of in a lonely group trying to make this case. I think partly because you and I both went through the ideological battles of the Great Recession, the failures of austerity, the huge amounts of prolonged human misery that was completely unnecessary because of the sort of austerity argument winning. But but giving you the short elevator pitch version of why the economy is good, actually. Well, the last crisis, it took us 10 years to get to this point on employment after the crash. And unemployment is currently 4%. It's been about two, about two years since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, the, the crash this time around was much more severe. I mean, millions of businesses just shut down. Uh, the unemployment rate went much higher, well over 14% compared to 10% last time around. Uh, it was a deeper crash and the the action and the real economy in a lot of ways is even worse. I mean, the pandemic is still going on. We, we're still living with the Omicron wave right now. So there are a lot of reasons why this crash should have been really, really terrible. And, and, and it, look, there's been a lot of hardship. A year ago today, 15% uh, of American parents were saying they didn't have enough money to feed their kids. So, um, you know, it's five times the typical rate in the United States. That's 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 not happening right now um, because we spent a lot of money and we spent a lot of money on American families. That doesn't mean the economy is without its problems. It's just of, of the sort of menu of options that you had a year ago, two years ago. This is far beyond anything that I thought was even remotely uh, on the table. 
Okay, Th think about that, folks. Think about that. The economy is doing a lot better than we all know. I mean, bankruptcies are at the lowest uh, rate that anyone has seen in decades. Uh, people have more money in their checking account better than they've seen in the, the same time last year, this time. I mean, there, there are numbers over and over again, but yet there's the angst of the people. Well, you know why you have the angst? There's some inflation that is created by the plutocracy. I want you all to blame, put blame where it belongs. I wish instead of being, uh, bringing Biden's numbers down to 41%, you would bring down the money, the, 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 the CEOs of ADM and all these companies who are raising the prices. Let me, let me give a qualification. If these people's stock prices are going up, if the amount of money that they're bringing in is going up, if they're shipping, shipping the same amount of products or more, what that tells you is that they're ripping the people off and they're doing wealth transfer. They're redistributing the money of the masses to the pockets of the few. And what they also continue to get those people by lying to them to believe some fallacy that somehow they're helping. And in that light, I want to bring a story. This one was actually the one that um, that Michael that Michael Rudnan asked me to talk about. And if you go to the NPR story that I have in the blog, you'll see that uh, the the hospitals are now screaming. Hospitals want the government to get involved in the private sector. You know, we we wanted healthcare in the private sector, right? Now the private hospitals want the government the bush administration to come into the private sector and tell their opponents that they cannot price their nurses at these high rates to travel around the country and do nursing they want to cripple it so the hospital association and all these other people they don't want to pay nurses to which i ask uh, what about us going into the executives of these corporations who makes not hundreds of thousands of dollars, but millions of dollars? Suppose we go in there and say, look, you guys are squandering the comp You guys are squandering the monies that people are paying to the hospitals. Okay. How can a CEO be worth $15 million? And he complains about a nurse who's going to make a couple of hundred thousand dollars because she's working or he's working their butts off for 18 hours a day. See, that's how, that's how capitalism work. We, the executives, we, the shareholders, the ones that do nothing of consequence to the, to the actual business. We don't want our mega salaries cut, but those darn nurses, if they're making a little bit too much, that's going to eat into some of the profits that I can make. We need the government assistance. We need the government to come in to this capitalist society. We need the government to come in and get rid of those nurses' ability to price themselves higher. Wow. Isn't, that, isn't supply and demand supposed to work? If we wanted to have, if we wanted to have nurses at better pricing, what we would have done is the corporations would have paid taxes so that nursing schools and, hot, and, and, and medicine, like schools of medicine could actually have bigger classes, could have more nurses, and all of that. They just needed to pay taxes so we could afford to educate more nurses, more doctors, etc. That's all they needed to do. Pay your taxes so that the government that you're begging now to put chains on to nurses... That they, don't, that they, that instead of using the government to put chains on people, use the government to expand the field. Pay your taxes. You don't want to pay taxes. You want to give an inordinate amount of money to your shareholders and executives and the people who actually do the work, the nurses. You want to neuter them. Wow. When I talk to you guys about capitalism and the evils within, these are the kinds of concepts that I talk about. Nobody talked about get the government in there to tell them to stop paying CEOs the kind of salaries. These are public companies, right? 
private companies, but publicly, meaning a lot of people invest in these companies. You know, uh, suppose it was supposed to say, okay, government tell them they cannot make that kind of money. They simply cannot make, those executives are not allowed to make that kind of money. That's what we need to do, right? So uh, I want you guys to really think about this issue. Uh, we only have about five minutes left in the show till I must go, but um, I am going to leave the other two pieces for tomorrow. I'm going to go ahead and do my ask now, and then I'll, and when I'm done with my ask, we're going to close up. But check this out. Alberto Willis, as host of Politics Done Right, a progressive radio media show on Pacifica Networks, KPFT 90.1 FM Houston, that engages all ideologies. I found that our political angst isn't mostly ideological. There is a well designed effort by many in power to control us. If we are at each other's throats, we are less likely to demand our economic and local wishes. In that light, I wrote three books. I wrote the first one titled, As I See It, Class Warfare, the Only Resort to Right Wing Doom, to describe the entire economy in a manner we can all understand. It highlights why it was designed to pill for most as it empowers a few, the chosen. The second book, titled It's Worth It, How to Talk to Your Right-Wing Relatives, Friends, and Neighbors, take it to the next level. After understanding how the system pilfers, it is incumbent that we can speak to our peers to empower a change. The third book, How to Make America Utopia, Take Away the Economy from Those Who Rigged It, gives us a place to land. After learning about our economy, economy that is that dysfunctional, dysfunctional for most, most and learning how to engage, engage the other side, side we point out what, what would make an economy, economy that, works that works for all. Each book, Each book stands, stands on its own, but together, but together they, provide they provide the full, the full picture. picture. Please, Please consider, consider getting, getting one, one or more. more. You will you undoubtedly will learn, learn, be entertained, entertain, and help and us help continue us the mission with our blogs, blogs articles, articles, videos, videos and, books. and books. All right, folks, you can get that, of course, at politicsunright.com slash books, politicsunright.com slash books please continue getting the program there you can also go ahead and we, we have a lot of new products at our store please go to politicsunright.com slash store where you can get all our logo stuff there just perfectly fine uh then if you can you can support us going to politicsunright.com slash paypal politicsunright.com slash paypal uh, as well as politicsunright.com slash patreon and of course if you're on youtube click that join button become a part of our pdr posse we need your support um, I have a lot of messages here, but I am not going to be able to get to them. But I, I, I want to take up on something that Eric Hayes says because, uh, you know, uh, uh, because it's important. This is important. He said, capitalism makes America rich and powerful country. You just boasted on early in the show. Where do you think that comes from? The free markets and power to do business. Do that with a sociologist society and see how it changes that narrative. First of all, um, Biden, Biden said something yesterday, two days ago, that really got me upset. This is what he said. He said, I am a capitalist. And then he said, capitalism without competition is, what again? Extort, not extortion, uh, what's the word he used? Capitalism without, I don't remember what word he used, but it, it meant something like extort. What was it? Exploitation. I didn't hear. Exploitation. That's right. Thank you. My daughter just told it to me. Capitalism without, okay, without with, capitalism without competition is exploitation. To which I said, I am so sorry he said that because capitalism is by design exploitation. Let me go down this road in, in steps because it's important. The definition of capitalism supposedly is an efficient allocation of resources, okay? That's what they claim. But here's what that also means. It also means the following. They also claim, as Milton Friedman, the, the new god of capitalism, that the sole purpose of executives within a corporation is to maximize the profits of that corporation and to maximize the values to the shareholder. So when if he says that, what it also means is if I have a corporation and corporation A and corporation B is doing the same thing I do, if I am to follow the tenets of capitalism, maximize shareholder value, I must find a way to get rid of that competition. And when I get rid of that competition, I form a monopoly. And when I form a monopoly, I can then charge whatever I want 
and thus maximize the profits for the shareholders and the bonuses for the executives, it is also the most efficient form. Because it's efficient, I don't have anybody to appease. I have nobody to compete against. So the natural progression of capitalism is monopoly. And, and you know how we know that? Because it has already occurred. It is occurring today. You see all the concentration of food companies. We see all the concentration of media companies. We see all the concentration of every kind of company because to maximize the profits for their shareholders, they must buy up everything. And when you buy up everything, you become a monopoly. Facebook bought WhatsApp, Instagram, and others. You become a monopoly. That's the definition. What I believe in is free enterprise, strong social safety net, <coughs> sorry, and free enterprise. But folks, I got to get out of here. My name is Egberto Willis. Thank you so kindly for having been here. My name is Egberto Willis. This is Politics Done Right. And you guys know how I end this baby. I am what? What am I? I am out. We spend a lot of time deconstructing the news, trying to trying to parse it into a form that everybody can understand. We try to find those little nitpicks where uh, it goes, it flies above the fray, etc. If you really like these videos that we do, I want to ask a big favor. Please go ahead, number one, subscribe to our channel, and number two, please join if you can. Thank you so kindly for watching. Keep watching. Please remember to share. We must populate the entire internet with our progressive message, a message that we know is what most Americans say that they want. So help us please join.